morning, everyone, and all of you online as well. This is our series, Don't Blink. We're saying, think, don't blink. And we are thinking about the moral and cultural issues of our times that are so relevant to every generation, but certainly our own. And we are to be courageous in the face of lies and live in truth. We are to think biblically and live faithfully. And we want to know, what does the Bible actually say about the issues that surround us, that encompass all of life, all of the Christian faith? If you are a believer and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this encompasses all of your life, your faith, your family, your future, your freedom. We have uh, signs in the atrium as we are encouraging you to vote in this election as always, but uh, I believe it says something like your values, your voice, your vote. Yes, it includes all of life, your values, your voice, your vote, the way you live your life. The question is, in our generation, as it is in all generations of believers, is who will shape the future? Big question. Who will shape the future of the world, of our beloved nation, of our community. Will it be unbelievers or believers? Will it be secularists or followers of Jesus? Will it be the humanist and the Marxist? Or will it be those who believe in faith and freedom, the godly and the righteous? More and more, we are seeing in our generation this battle. We sang about the battle a moment ago. We are seeing this battle between light and darkness. I don't know about you, but as I observe what is going on in America today and around the world, I see this battle between right and wrong heating up, Christ and Antichrist. And it is so essential that we be spiritually prepared for this battle. America is in chaos. The streets of major cities are filled with mobs. Police and law enforcement are threatened. Stores are looted and robbed. Statues are torn down. Churches are desecrated. All in America, and we understand why some in our cities feel threatened by what's going on into the streets, and we also understand why some in our country are concerned about equality and about justice, whether it is racial or political or economic justice. The fact is the First Amendment guarantees the right of the people, and I quote, the right of the people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. And we affirm that. The key word is peaceable. Peaceable and peacefully. A peaceful assembly must not be a smokescreen for lawlessness or looting or rioting or burning or organized agitators and anarchists. The problem is, the problem in America today is the issue of authority. And the Bible warns against those who despise authority. And in our text before us, Romans chapter 13, verse 7 verses, we see what God says about law and order about crime and punishment, and yes, about Jesus and judgment. Verse 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. 
Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you are also to pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God. It did not say the preachers are the ministers of God in this case, but the authorities, those placed in authority, are ministers servants of God attending to this very thing. Wraps it up in verse 7, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to which revenue is owed, and respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. We live in a time which we are seeing decreasing respect for authority. We know that Satan is in the middle of this. Satan is the ultimate rebel and anarchist. And we are seeing the death of civility and debate and decency and discussion. And as a result, we are seeing self-destruction. One man said this, where there is no truth, only power remains. This is the reason we are speaking of God's truth in these days. Because once truth, capital T, is lost, God's truth, revealed in God's Word, once it is lost, once truth is gone, only raw power remains. I'm reading a brand new book on the life of Abraham Lincoln, certainly one of the great heroes of American history. Many believe, most believe, our greatest American president. It was Lincoln who said, if destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we will live forever or die by suicide. I want our nation to live under God. And therefore, we as believers and followers of Jesus shaping the future of our nation, for our family, for our friends, for our children and their children, we believe in God's law and order. First point I want to make to you is under the heading law and order. In the first four verses that we just read describe that the fact that Order comes from God himself. God has put in to every human being an inexpressible desire to bring order into society. It is written into the consciousness of a human being because it comes from God. Many people who do not even know Christ or who may not even believe in God are concerned with law and order concerned with crime and punishment, policies and politics. There are lawyers and governors and politicians and police and others who, again, may not have a personal faith in Jesus Christ, but innately, instinctively, within every person, there is created by God a desire for order rather than chaos. Now, God is the God of order. When he created the world, when he created the universe, he put everything in order. And that includes justice. God is the God of law and order of justice. And he has established rules uh, to regulate society. He gave them in his word. The Ten Commandments themselves are the framework for freedom in all societies. If we just live by the Ten Commandments, you wouldn't need uh, any other laws. He gave us these commandments 
And he also, because he is a God of judge, justice, he is a God of judgment. He holds everyone accountable to keep his law. And therefore, he judges sin. There is retribution because of rebellion against God's law. The scripture says, God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, he will also reap. So God gave us law through government. Law established through governing authorities based upon his own law. And without it, you have chaos, you have confusion, you have anarchy, and yes, you have violence. But not only has God established law and order for the sake of law itself, but also because of love. The generous welfare of God for humankind, for society. Love requires law and order. Because you love your children, you establish guidelines and rules for your family. That rule is based upon a relationship. And God loves you. God loves people. Therefore, he has placed rules, restraints within the culture to, to, to restore and, and, and to renew society when it is broken. And God establishes authority, therefore, and we are to be subject right here in the Scripture. Verse 1, see it again. Let every person be subject, that is, obedient to authority. Law and order is the framework for freedom. If there were no rules without retro, or rules without retribution, there would, no, there would be no freedom in society. Without boundaries, without boundaries, freedom cannot prevail. And so God has given us law and order. He establishes rulers and leaders of all kinds. Remember, when this scripture was given, Caesar was ruling in Rome. Paul, uh, a believer and follower of Jesus, a Jewish man who had converted to Jesus Christ, he understood that he was under the authority of the Roman government. And even in a case of, uh, of, of a capital offense against his life for preaching the gospel, he appealed to Caesar. He was, he was, he was subject to the leadership. And in the midst of all this election that's going on, we are reminded that no leader, no king, no president comes to power without God's sovereign control. The king's heart, the Bible says, is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. So the purpose of authority, the purpose of government, is the protection of life and property. The protection of the life we live in freedom. And to resist law and order is to rebel against God. You see that? To resist law and order is to rebel against God who has established law and order. How many of you have heard someone say, well... You cannot legislate morality. How many of you have heard someone say that? You might even have said that yourself. While it is true that you cannot make people obey the law or even to obey God, while it is true that you cannot legislate morality in that sense, it is also true that you can legislate against immorality. In fact, laws are given to us, including the Ten Commandments, that legislate against what is wrong and therefore to punish wrongdoers. Do you see that? Certainly there are things that are wrong and there's legislation. You know this. There is legislation that is there to prevent and to protect against immoral decision. Verse 2 says that he who resists authority 
is opposed to the ordinance or the institution of God. When you do the crime, the crime is against God. We can seek to change the government. We can appeal for better laws. We can protest. We can politic. We can elect new leaders in America. But we are to never defy what God has divinely decreed. The only time we are to disobey a law of man established by God, or rather the the decree uh, of man, the man who is established by God, the only time we are to defy the law is if that law defies the law of God. We must obey God and not man. And that's conscientious objection, of course, and that's appropriate in Scripture. In Scriptures, Christians are commanded to live in submission to the authorities of all time, authority that God has placed over us. There are three primary institutions that God has established. One, of course, and first is marriage, home, and family. And God has placed a divine order in marriage, home, and family. Then there is the church. The people of God. God established his people in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, and then when Christ came, the Messiah, he established his church, and Christ is building his church, and the church is central and core to civil society and citizenship for the Christian. And within the church, there is divine authority and there is order. And the third institution that God has given human beings is government. So you have marriage, home, and family, you have the church, and you have government. And therefore, under the authority of God, we are to live in law and order. Romans, uh, pardon me, 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. You know, if you know your basic civics, and many young people, unfortunately, do not know basic civics, they're not being taught not only the patriotic history of America in our generation, but they're not being taught basic civics in some instances. But America is a nation of laws. We are a nation based upon laws to be lived out in freedom. 1 Peter 2, 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, but not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Verse 17 says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. I would define that as good citizenship, law and order. We're told in Titus that chapter 3 verse 1 that we're not to malign our, our leaders or to speak evil against those who are in public service. As a Christian, you're a parent. Don't speak evil of the police officers who surround us. Don't speak evil of leaders. Don't malign them. That's directly out of Scripture. Because these are ministers, back to, back to Romans 13, these are ministers ordained of God to serve our community, to serve our nation. We do give honor to whom honor is due. And on this day in which we are honoring you, representative of law enforcement all across this nation and in our community, we do back you. And we stand with you. We want to fund you and pray for you. And... (laughs) And support you. Don't you dare demonize the police. These are good men and women. What is a policeman? 
I read this just this week. It's long, but it's good. I'm going to read it to you. A policeman is many things. He is a son, a brother, a father, an uncle, and sometimes even a grandfather. He is a protector in time of need and a comforter in a time of sorrow. His job calls for him to be a diplomat, a psychologist, a lawyer, a friend, and an inspiration. He suffers from an overdose of publicity about brutality and dishonesty. He suffers far more from the notoriety produced by unfounded charges. Too often acts of heroism go unnoticed and the truth is buried under all the criticism. The fact is that less than one half of 1% of policemen ever discredit their uniform. That's a better average than you'll find among clergymen. A policeman is an ordinary guy who is called upon for an extraordinary bravery for us. His job may sometimes seem routine, but the interruptions can be moments of stark terror. He is the man who faces a half-crazed gunman, who rescues a lost child, who challenges a mob, who risks his neck more than we realize. He deserves, she deserves our respect and our profound thanks. A policeman stands between the law abider and the law breaker. He is the prime reason your home hasn't been burned, your family abused, and your business looted. Try to imagine what would happen, what might happen if there were no policemen around. <coughs> then try to think of ways to make their job more rewarding. Show them the respect you really have. Offer them a smile and a kind word. See that they don't have to be magicians to raise their family on less than adequate salaries. We think policemen are great. We thank God for all the little boys and girls who, they, who said they would be policemen and they kept their promise. We hope you feel the same way and we hope that you will show it so that there will always be enough good policemen to go around. Amen. And thank you who are serving. The second point that I want to make is that of crime and punishment. We've talked about law and order, established authorities by God. But what about crime and punishment? Because in Romans 13, it talks about the judgment of God that is mitigated, mediated, between the servants of God, the ministers of God, that is, those who enforce and execute the law. Romans 13 tells us that there is punishment that is delivered by due authorities, delegated by the government, and that crime has consequences. And therefore, that co the consequences are punishment, whether it be in fines or in greater cases of law and beyond misdemeanors, the breaking of moral law and the nation's laws, there is uh, imprisonment and even capital punishment. Four things I want you to write down about punishment, what it is. I don't have time this morning to talk about all the legal implications of crime and punishment. But I'm giving you the straight up scripture as to what the Bible says. Punishment is preventative. There is in the very fact that people are punished, the reality that it can be a, and should be, a deterrent to crime itself. It is preventative of other crimes. If you commit a crime and you are punished in jail or even in death for a murderous crime, it is preventative of crime being committed, again, by you. Punishment is corrective. The goal of punishment is corrective. It is corrective in society for the welfare of society, and it is corrective in the individual who rebels against the laws of God and of the nation. Punishment is also punitive. Not all punishment is corrective some is punitive in that it is punishment for the punishment itself and that includes the death penalty 
and capital punishment, which is taught in this very scripture. He does not bear the sword in vain. The sword, in this case, is an instrument of death and execution. The sword, obviously referenced here, is the sword of capital punishment. The terror and the fear of death due to capital crimes, such as murder. Now, at the very dawn of society, after the days of Noah, when God put the whole world in, the, in a gas chamber, H2O, and flooded the earth, and only left were the, was Noah and his families. And on the heels of that retribution and judgment of the earth, God said this in Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Now, that is a principle in God's word before the law of Moses, before the laws of Israel. It is a principle of life and death that is written in to the very foundation of civilization. I repeat it, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Flip back to Romans 13. The New Testament is teaching us that the sword is to be born as an instrument of death to those who break God's standards and laws. And the laws are to be established. The laws are to be equally applied. And the laws are to be executed. Romans 12, 19 says this, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So God has established this law and order with crime and punishment. Not There's never a place for personal vendettas or vigilantism. Because God has established government and one of the means of government, the most important functions of government, is to establish capital punishment. You say, wait, 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 wait. What about the Bible verse, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 when it says, you shall not kill And there are some well-meaning people, I presume, others some bleeding hearts, who point to that scripture and say, there it is, there it is, you shall not kill. They may be pacifists or for whatever reason they choose. They say, thou shall not kill. Isn't it interesting, isn't it absolutely crazy that the same people who oppose capital punishment and just war, the same people who affirm abortion and the killing of the innocent. It just drives me absolutely nutty. But I digress, though that's a good digression. The Sixth Commandment says, thou shalt not, you shall not murder. The Scripture allows for the protection of, your prop- of yourself and your body and, and, and self-defense. The, the Scripture allows for just war. But you shall not murder means you shall not take another human being's life. And lawbreakers are to be justly punished by the God-ordained authorities. It says we bear not the sword in vain. Yes, the Bible teaches capital punishment. You say, well, what about those victims that were executed and it was wrong? They became a victim. Well, I say this tenderly. That is a tragedy when that happens, and it has happened. But let me also say, as a victim of murderous crime, our family, what about the victims and their 
of others crime and taking the life of a family member or friend what about those victims there would be far fewer innocent victims if there were few fewer or many more guilty executions it's a fact my father was brutally murdered in 1970 we never sought personal revenge. We left it up to the lawmakers. Ultimately, we left it up to God. And in all the years when the murderer of my father was in jail, we were told the death penalty was not uh, being practiced in those days, in the early 1970s. I believe it was reinstituted by the Supreme Court in 1976. So the man who killed my father, I give this as a testimony to you, was sent to prison on a life sentence, and we were told he'll not be out for a minimum of 40 years. 40 years in, we said, okay. I never, test, never checked on it. Never checked on him. Just left it with God. And so did the rest of our family. Until... About two years ago, the Lord prompted me to try to find the murderer of my father and speak with him. We began to search and look, and because the records were hard to find here in Texas, and that period took a long time. But thanks to some friends, we were able to find out that this man was let out of jail after 20 years. Now, I don't know the circumstances. Could have been great behavior. I pray that the man came to faith in Jesus Christ. I really do. I pray that he knows the Lord. But in the same documents that said he was let out of jail in 20 years for the murder of my father, who took away our father, my, my, my mother's husband, at the age of 56, the year he got out, documents are clear. He died in a matter of two or three weeks of acute leukemia. Now, I don't know how to describe that to you other than to say, when you leave judgment to the Lord, he does what he promises he will do. Judgment comes from God. Ultimately, if judgment and justice is not done among men, God will take care of it. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So we are to forgive. We are to live in freedom of another person's crime and to live in the fullness of that freedom and of that forgiveness and let justice take its course. God's justice. So, the Supreme Court of the United States is in the news right now. Amy Coney Barrett will be confirmed as the ninth justice, and our nation's highest court recognizes <laughs> the nation's highest court recognizes the terrible necessity of the death penalty. It does. We do not celebrate when any person dies. It's a tragedy when any person dies, but that does not limit the law's requirement and God's requirement of justice. Law and order belongs to God. This is not man-made. This is God-made. And as Bible-believing Christians, we affirm it. Justice must be enforced. Again, not vigilante, not personal vendettas. We let it go, and we let God through his assigned governing authorities. We're to never avenge ourselves, never avenge ourselves, but leave wrath and judgment to God. There's no place for private or personal vengeance, but God has established the government and those who execute the laws as enforcers 
and executors, God ordained. And by the way, God himself will deal with evildoers himself. It's not over when the judgment comes here because divine wrath is poured out upon unrepentant sinners. One final point, I close, just a couple of minutes. Jesus and justice. We've talked about law and order. We've talked about crime and punishment. But what about Jesus and justice? Jesus and judgment. Jesus affirmed capital punishment. You say, where is that? In the garden, before his own execution, before he was delivered to, to, uh, 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 to be executed for the sins of mankind. Impulsive, pugnacious Peter was in the garden with him that night when Jesus is praying and surrendering his will to the will of the Father. And when the, uh, uh, the arresters came to take Jesus away, Peter, what did he do? He grabbed a sword and started swinging. The first one in line for this fisherman, not that good a swordsman, he swung wildly. And Malchus, the high servant of the priest, ducked and Peter cut off his ear. And that's when Jesus said, Peter, stop it. If you live by the sword, you what? What Jesus said is what Genesis 9, 6 is saying. What Romans 13 is is saying, you take a life and your life will be taken. It's biblical, it's our worldview. It's like surgery. The scripture says in Numbers 35, 33, if there's blood polluting the land, you shall not pollute the land in which you live for blood pollutes the land and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed in it except by the blood of the one who shed it clear. It may not be your mo emotional or personal charge, but it's the biblical position. You say it's so harsh. Yes, well, hell is harsh. Nobody likes to hear much about judgment. And we should never speak of judgment without tenderness. But there is a terrible breakdown of society when murderers and criminals of extreme type are allowed to run free. The breakdown of law and order will destroy a country quicker than anything. Jesus knows this. Jesus himself took our judgment on the cross. He died at the hands of wicked men. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. And there is only one cure for breaking the law, the laws of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, Romans 6.23, is eternal life. The only cure is repentance and redemption in Jesus Christ. And every sin can be forgiven. There is no sin that is unforgivable except to reject, finally, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus took the fires and the pain and the punishment that we deserved on the cross and bore on his own body. By his stripes we are healed. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And I believe in our generation, stay with me, that God is giving America a warning. Judgment is coming unless we repent, unless we find forgiveness and redemption in Jesus Christ. The Bible says the soul that sins shall surely die. And so what did Jesus do? He took our death and he took our hell and he took our judgment. He was not a lawbreaker, but he died as a lawbreaker in order that we could be forgiven 
and our trespasses forgiven so that we could be forever saved. And there is no person beyond the love and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no person, murderer or not, who cannot be forgiven if you would come to faith in Christ. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Has there ever been a time and a place, I didn't ask you if you had a church or you were religious or are religious or not. I'm asking you, has there been a time, a place, a definitive moment, a miracle in your life when you have passed from death to life, when you have personally put your trust in Jesus Christ? Wherever you are, I'm speaking to people in prisons right now. Many people in prisons and jails watch our program. I'm speaking to you. I'm talking to you. You can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. I'm talking to the smallest child, innocent in so many ways, and yet in need of a Savior, just like I was when I was a little boy. Everybody needs Jesus. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you will repent of your sin, which means to turn and trust in Jesus Christ, you can be transformed. Did you know the Apostle Paul, the great missionary, was a murderer? He said it himself. He said, I was the chief of sinners, a murderer. He held the clothes of those who stoned Stephen. He chased down Christians and persecuted and killed them. He said, I was a murderer. But by the grace of God, he was forgiven and transformed and changed. And became the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. Jesus can change your heart. Will you pray like this, Lord Jesus? I invite you to come into my life. I know I have sinned and broken your commandments. I'm a lawbreaker. But I trust you. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. And then pray, Lord, give me the courage to stand for you and to live for you by the power of your spirit until you come for me. I'm going to ask you to make that decision public today. If you're watching online, just type into this number, 74788, the word Jesus, and we're standing by to encourage you and help you. Know Christ as your personal Savior. And in this room, You're praying to receive Christ. I'm now going to ask you to do what Jesus commanded us to do, and that is to confess him before everyone. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father in heaven. I'm going to ask you in just a moment when we stand and sing to come forward. In the act of coming forward, you'll be saying, I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus. I prayed that prayer. I'm inviting Christ into my life, and today I'm going to take a stand for Christ and live for him by his grace with his help. I'll live for Jesus. There are others who need a church home, a church family. You've been visiting this church. Maybe you've been watching online. You've come here today. Online, we are establishing online communities for your faith and your uh, fellowship here. But in this room, I'm going to invite you to come forward. And you also will stand here and say, I want to join this church. I'm a believer. I know Christ. And I want to now belong to Prestonwood and be a part of this church family. I'm going to ask you to lead the way. Set the example for everyone else. You know Jesus. You love Jesus. You want to love his church and be a part of it. Come today. If you want to come and kneel and pray, it's always appropriate to pray for people who need the Lord. To pray for yourself. To pray for your family. This this altar is open. It's alive with God's presence. And people come and follow him. So, Lord, take now this time of decision. May your Holy Spirit use it for your glory to bring people to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for worship at Prestonwood. As you heard earlier, if you made a decision for Christ, please text JESUS to 74788. We would love to connect with you and give you these great resources to help you grow in your faith. One is a New Believer's Bible with helpful notes to help you study God's Word. The other is a book by Pastor Jack Graham on the next steps to take as you pursue this new life in Christ. 
As we close, I'd like to thank you for your faithful giving to support Prestonwood and the work God is doing through our ministries. If you would like to give, text the word GIVE to 74788 or visit prestonwood.org give. It's been a joy worshiping with you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.